Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. First off, I just want to let people know we have been seeing some issues with the member site recently. It has to do with the billing software and trying to work out a solution for this. So if, if you do find that you're locked out or you just go to a continual flashing screen, um, maybe something glitched in the software. I had to fix a few lately. So just send an email off to brotherjohnf at yahoo.com. That's the fastest way to get those issues resolved. So let's look at the charts here. I've drawn up a chart. This is silver spot over gold spot. And uh, I just did this for comparative purposes. We're going to be looking at an article from Adam Hamilton over at Zeal uh, covered on Silver Doctors. But I just wanted to show you for comparisons how big the difference is in the corrections between gold and silver. Um, so I've drawn a line here of where gold has corrected back to and it goes back to roughly the beginning of 2010 or the just the very end of 2009 you can see at this point here. That's where we're currently at on the gold price. Whereas on the silver price we've not only corrected through that would have been the equivalent of $20 price. We're all the way down here under 15 and that actually takes us back to a price we had in 2006, which is really incredible. Um, just anecdotally, try to think of something that you can buy at 2006 prices. Uh, maybe some houses in some neighborhoods that uh, have collapsed. Um, I can't really think of too much else. Maybe some consumer electronics have come down. Let's say if you're talking about... 48-inch uh, flat-screen TV. I guess that's what the Fed's using for their inflation index. So that just gives you a picture of how extreme the selling has been. And of course, we know that the selling is primarily paper selling. So let's look at the latest here from Adam Hamilton. But I want to show you first the compare silver prices. Now keep this in mind when we're looking at the article. Um, if you remember, I talked about how in 2008, back in March of 2008, when silver had hit the $21 high, $21.50, something like that, and then we had Bear Stearns collapsing that spring, uh, there was a huge smash in silver. Uh, Percentage-wise, it was one of the biggest because we went from $21.50 down to $8.50, so that's a huge percentage drop. Uh, we're, we're on par with that right now. but. As I watched, the coin that I watched, because I wasn't really into the Lunar Series or the Perth Mint at that time. Unfortunately, I wish I would have been. But I remember watching the prices of the Silver Eagle, and I never saw Silver Eagles go below $16. Not that anyone could get them for below $16 the whole time. From the fall of from the fall of the price of $21.50 all the way down to that $8.50, I still never saw Silver Eagles go under $16. Now that's pretty amazing considering that at $8.50 the premium would have to be almost 100%. But you can see here on the Eagles, the lowest price we've got here is a 25% premium. As you know, we've been watching the, the premiums on junk. You can see the lowest is 20%. And that's pretty much the case across the board. We've got 13, 16, 23% for the box. That's a really big premium for a box of Silver Eagles. 23% premium is the cheapest. So this is the sort of thing that you see when you have paper markets controlling the physical markets. There just isn't the silver to deliver. And of course, we know that the mint shut down, not surprisingly. So I wanted to examine this chart here and read a little bit from Adam Hamilton. Again, this is on Silver Doctors. He, he talks about gold and the shorting in gold, and then he's talking about silver. And amazingly, the situation is even more extreme in silver futures. Speculators also just ramped their leverage downside silver bets to the highest levels since at least 1999 and almost certainly ever. And unlike gold, which barely edged out record shorting, today's silver future shorting is far higher than the last record. So silver, too, is on the verge of a massive, if not record, short covering frenzy running parallel with gold. Now, sometimes Adam Hamilton's charts can be a little bit confusing. Sometimes there's a little bit too much information on them. 
So if you look on this chart, this blue line, let's uh, actually do a view image and just look at the chart here. So the blue line that we're looking at is just the silver price. Whereas this red line is the shorting. This is the number of total short contracts. So you can see what he's trying to juxtapose here is the when the shorting gets to an extreme, there usually is a rally in price. Uh, probably the most pronounced one is going to be here or here, and then what we're apparently being set up for. So that's the kind of logic behind this. In this latest Commitment of Traders Week, American Future Speculators total short bets on silver soared 81.6 thousand contracts. This is astoundingly high levels that defy all reason. In recent years, these positions have returned to 27K contract support no fewer than five times. That means that this red line would revert to the mean, and that means that the blue line would rise correspondingly, unless they do something different this time. Mean reverting to that same level from today's extremes will require 54.6 thousand contracts of short covering buying at 5,000 ounces per contract. That is a vast amount of silver. We're talking about 273 million ounces of silver that will be bought in the futures markets within several months or less. Assuming three months, this equates to marginal new buying that doesn't exist today of 91 million ounces per month. According to the Silver Institute, the average global silver investment demand in 2014 ran just 16.5 million ounces a month. So this short covering alone would temporarily boost that demand by 552%. Short covering episodes in recent years have fueled silver gains of up to 32.6% in just over eight weeks. And while silver prices also have a strong inverse correlation with speculators' future shorting, this relationship has moderated in the last year or so. I suspect the reason is sentiment plays a far greater role in silver's price levels than in gold's, and silver sentiment is totally dependent on gold's fortunes. So silver is essentially slaved to gold, with traders always looking to gold's price action for their silver trading cues. Silver can enjoy major uplegs unless gold is rallying and traders expect it to keep on climbing into the future. Obviously, with gold's sentiment so hyper-bearish in recent years, this necessary prerequisite to strong silver uplegs hasn't existed, but sentiment is forever cyclical. Bullishness will return. A secondary reason silver short covering upside price action has been muted in the past year is its lower leverage. At $15 silver, each futures contract controls $75,000 of this metal, but the minimum margin is still $7,000 per contract. That works out to maximum leverage under 11 times, far lower than the 31 times in gold futures. Lower margin Lower leverage means lower risk, which makes short covering somewhat less frantic. But with speculators' total silver future short position so mind-bogglingly high, odds are the coming silver short covering frenzy will really surprise to the upside. Of course, investors and speculators can bet on these coming mean reversions of excessive future shorting in physical gold and silver, and they're leading, and here we go where I disagree with them completely, leading ETFs, SPDRs, SLV, and then he goes on into the miners. Radically greater upside exists in the beaten down gold and silver miners. Just this week, their leading index slumped to astounding 12.1 year low. Now this is where I'm going to disagree with them on this. I don't think the miners are going to come back this time. I may be wrong, um, but the thing is, is which miners are going to survive. Now there's kind of an interesting little anecdotal comment here down at the bottom. I can't vouch to whether or not this is true, uh, but this is just what someone says. This is Art005, and he says, a buddy of mine went to a stock meeting for a micro cap gold company he owned. There had been a lot of shorting going to apparently bankrupt the company. They had to show proof of stock ownership to enter the room. Once the meeting started, the CEO announced there were more stock shares owned in the room than had been issued. Plus, not all of the stock owners were even there. So, we're not talking about 
fair markets or free markets anymore. We're talking about complete corruption. I've talked about the DTCC before, failures to deliver. I know many of you have followed the the overstock.com story and their CEO. I think it's uh, Patrick Byrne who has fought them and he's publicly stated a number of times that they have counted more shares short than exist. Now, we know that the way that shorting works is that you have to borrow something to short it. So with your stocks, uh, that means that the ones that are held in street name, uh, you allow your broker to loan those to other people so they can short them. Now, who is loaning out silver? Who has silver? Um, who's loaning it out to short? Well, I think the answer is pretty clear. There isn't any silver being borrowed when this shorting is occurring. They're, they're not using real silver. These are just paper prices, paper against paper. So I do not agree with the analogy and the argument that there have to be short covering rallies. I don't think there has to be anything in, in those markets, in those paper markets that they are utterly corrupt and the regulators that are supposed to regulate them are utterly corrupt. So for that reason, I personally stay away from any miners or any other obligation, whether it's a SPDR or an ETF or any kind of fund that is a promise to pay something because I think we're far, far past the point where any trust can be maintained in any of these. Uh, I think they're completely corrupt. We have a lot of things that are going to blow up and there, there's a lot of people that are just working to kick the can down the road so that it doesn't happen on their watch. So I wanted to show you just one coin that uh, I found here on eBay. Um, it's, it's really hard to assess what something is worth. I was looking at the half ounce dragon on Atmex and they're asking 30 bucks for that one and uh, that's a little bit high they're going on eBay for 23 24 but I was curious and I wanted to pull up the two ounce dragon and I found this auction you can see this one was from July 12th and again this is just anecdotal information you can't establish prices by you know just one auction but it does give you some information of what people are willing to pay so you can see that on the 12th of July, this two ounce silver lunar dragon went for $76. So that's the equivalent of $38 an ounce. Now, there was no time in 2012 where silver was anywhere near that price. And I'm trying to think the best price I got my two ounce dragons for, and I can't remember. I think it was below 60 but I don't remember what the price was. Um, it might have been, yeah, it might have been around 60. Uh, so there's an example of a coin that has appreciated as the price of silver really, I think, has been cut in half since, let's go and look at the price, uh, because that coin was primarily being sold in the fall of 2011 and throughout the year during 2012. So you can see here, we had the tests uh, in late 2011, we had you know this violent fluctuation between say 36 and we'll just say 36 and 26. So the average was, was really right there around 30 bucks. So you could see that uh, for the time that that coin was selling, uh, the, the lowest the silver price was 26 bucks and the highest it was around 36 bucks. So for the most part, people were buying those around $30 silver. Uh, they weren't much cheaper. So that's a very important factor as well. Looking at this $76 price, you can see that nobody's willing to take a loss on the coin and they are getting bidders. So you can see there's seven bidders and they had a total of 14 bids. You can see the bidding, you know, started at irrelevancy. But uh, on the 5th of July, that's pretty much when the bidding happened. It was bid all the way up to $69. Uh, 
someone came in with 72, then 75, then 76 was the winning bid. So in a time period where the price of silver was cut in half, this coin appreciated at least 25% in value. And that's why we look at those coins. Uh, the fact that you can get right now, I think Gainesville, let me double check on that. I think Gainesville has them still at 40 bucks or maybe even a little bit less. Uh, and I don't think they got the half ounce in again but we'll see here. If you just think about those prices of getting uh, half ounce silver Perth lunar coins for under $10, that's pretty amazing. And uh, I, w I was really shocked by that. They didn't last. So here it is. Here is the, um, well, they're gone. Let's, let's go by lowest price. Yeah, they were there earlier today and they're gone. So it looks like somebody snapped up the last of those. That's uh, that's not surprising. Um, so we'll have to go over to JM Bullion and, and Provident. The, the price is hovering around 40 bucks. So with the Dragon going for nearly 80 bucks, I don't really see how that can be a loser. Now, are we gonna go lower here? It looks like we're gonna we're gonna test lower, especially with the grease thing. Um, that was just a, a big can kicking uh, exercise. You can see here that the MACD is turning down. This is the weekly MACD. We had the bottoming out all the way back here. Then we had the attempt to test the zero line. It failed. We sold off again. We have another attempt to get to the zero line right there, and it failed. We're rolling over again. So do I think we're going to get lower prices? I think we probably are going to see a spike low, but the problem is going to be getting silver at those prices. I really don't think you're going to see many of the coins that you would like to pick up go much lower. It's already that the premiums have sucked up the difference for the Eagles. Now it's happening in the uh, junk bags. So even though we may get that dip or you know rapid decline or, or slow decline and then bounce back, whatever we get, it's gonna be difficult to get silver that you want at those prices. Maybe about the only thing you're gonna be able to pick up is something like Buffalo Rounds, which again, I personally don't like because I have my Buffalo Rounds from 2008 and they're worth about 16 bucks each. So I still like the Lunars. It may be a very good time to pick more of them up if you can find them at all. And we'll talk to you next time.